Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 332. Hello, True Health Seeker, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health Podcast. Today we have with us the best interview I have ever experienced. Not because of the questions I asked, but because of our guests. Now, I love every interview. I've done over 300 of them, and I've had the pleasure of interviewing some of the most amazing holistic health doctors and experts, and all of them bring amazing value to the table, amazing, life-changing holistic health information. So I just want to start by saying that every episode is outstanding and helps us to transform our health. This episode, however stands out in my mind and will forever stand out in my mind as one of my absolute favorite interviews. And I know it will for you as well. The interview was quite long, so we broke it up into two parts. So this is part one. And in the intro to the interview, my understanding was that her technology and her background was to eliminate chronic pain very successfully. She very successfully eliminates chronic pain like fibromyalgia, pain that nothing else helps, not even pharmaceutical medicine helps. Her system works. And then we got deeper and deeper into it and discovered that her system does much, much more than that. It's over 100 years old. It's absolutely proven there's been uh, clinical workups and medical journals, articles written about it. It's worldwide, over 4,000 practitioners use it. And today we have with us the woman who is bringing it to the public and spreading it around the world. This technology, you have the pleasure of learning about it now, but in 10 or 15 years, it will be standard practice in all clinics and hospitals. I'm very excited for you to learn about it here first. Enjoy today's interview. Please share it with all your friends who you know would love to learn how to reverse disease naturally and support the body's ability to heal itself. I want to let you know something really cool. We just added a new tab to the menu of learntruehealth.com. You can find all the detailed show notes of every episode at learntruehealth.com. So you can use the search function. You can search anything from diseases to diets to anything about health that you're interested in and see which topics we've explored with all the different kinds of guests. At the very top of our website, you will see uh, something in the menu that says Ashley Recommends. Go ahead and click there and you'll find that I have accumulated my absolute favorite health gadgets and everything from what I have in my kitchen to what I recommend my uh, clients use and my holistic health clients to what the guests on the show have recommended. So I have all the fitness gadgets, the best books that I recommend, everything I have in my kitchen, all the health gadgets and all the goodies, everything that I have around my house that I rely on and I recommend and I know that you will love as well. So you can check that out. Uh, just go to learntrail.com and click on in the menu, click on Ashley Recommends. I have my favorite juicers, literally everything in my kitchen that I ha- I make sure that I have and use on a daily basis to cook holistic, toxic-free, healthy foods. So enjoy and uh, let me know if there's anything that you think I should absolutely add to my list of all my recommended things to have in the house and home and in the kitchen. Uh, I'd love to take a look and know what your favorite things are. Let's discuss that in our Facebook group, the Learn Trail Facebook group. I'll make sure I start a a thread and we'll talk about our favorite uh, house items and gadgets for our holistic health journey. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being a listener. Thank you so much for sharing the Learn Trail podcast with those you love. I know you're going to love today's episode. Make sure you also check out part two as we get into some amazing stuff in part two as well. 
I am so excited for today's guest. We have with us an amazing doctor on the show who has figured out how to heal a chronic pain, especially fibromyalgia pain, those pains that haven't been able to be helped by anything else. She's discovered a, a type of methodology that helps the tissue to heal and to relieve chronic persistent pain. Dr. Carolyn McMakin, I am so excited to have you on the show. I've looked into your work and your machine, the frequency specific microcurrent machine. And I just have so many questions for you. And I know that the listeners do too, especially the listeners who are suffering from pain, fibromyalgia pain and the myofascial pain syndrome. You get to a point when you're in chronic pain where you feel hopeless and desperate and we're willing to do anything, even take drugs that we know are harming us just to gain a little bit of relief. And your system has been proven to relieve pain that nothing else relieves. And so without a doubt, I know today you are going to touch some lives and change some lives today with your information. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Ashley. It's really nice to be with you. It's um, It has been 22 years that we've been using frequency-specific microcurrent, and um, we do exactly what you described. That is that is our goal, <laughs> to help every patient in pain who wants to be helped. And I had to decide in 1997 whether... I was going to be the only one doing it, or um, if I was going to teach it, and it made more sense to me and seemed more ethical to me to teach it, number one, to validate it, find out if the technology and the methodology, was it really doing what it seemed to do, or was it working because the walls in my clinic were pink and I'm a nice guy? And... Um, it turned out when I taught it for the first time in 1997, um, I taught it rather badly, actually, but taught it for the first time in 1997 that the results that we get with FSM are teachable and reproducible. And um, we started out treating chronic pain patients and um, have moved, have discovered over time by using FSM many other things that it's good for. So I'm I'm excited to be with you and to, to share that information with you. Absolutely. Um, now you shared with me that you have uh, 4,000 practitioners worldwide. So you have been quite busy since 1997 training practitioners. <laughs> and yes, I, indeed. that's amazing because I imagine if each practitioner had could see, you know, a hundred patients a year or 300 patients a year, just how many people uh, in the course of 10 or 20 years they have helped. And yet it only scratches the surface because of how many people are in chronic pain. And so right. I'm really glad that you are teaching this. So those who are listening today who are practitioners in the holistic health realm, uh, they know that you can be trained in this uh, system to further help people to to eliminate pain. Before we get into how this works and how you discovered it and all these great questions, I'd love to learn a bit more about you and your story. What led you to want to become a doctor and uh, why did you want to help people? Why did you want to help people heal? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I was 39 years old. We were I was married with a three-year-old and a seven-year-old, and we were living in San Diego, and my husband was going to come up to Portland and go to chiropractic college. And um, we're packing up a, a household and two kids, and I stopped to have lunch about two weeks before we left. I stopped to have lunch with a friend of mine, and told her that, you know, we're packing up, we're moving in two weeks. And she looked at me and she said, that's really stupid. I said, excuse me? Because he was going to go to chiropractic college and I was going to be the doctor's wife and run the office. And she said, that's really stupid. He just wants a job. You've wanted to be a doctor for as long as I've known you. I said, 
yeah, but I have a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. How am I going to do that? Now, my entree into medicine, besides just general inclination, was I became a pharmaceutical salesman when I was 25. Graduated from college, um, was trained in sales, had a couple of sales jobs, and then interviewed with pharmaceutical company and got a job with Riker 3M in 1971. And at the time, there were three women pharmaceutical salesmen in the country. Wow. I was the only one with Riker. I was one of two in California, and the other one was with Lilly in the Midwest. And so I spent seven years with that company, seven years with... Um, Ayers American Home Products, and then two years with McNeil. So I've sold every class of drugs except for antibiotics and psychotropics. So I've called on every kind of medical physician. And back in 1971, I was this cute little size seven girl. And the doctors weren't used to women pharmaceutical reps. And so they were, most of them in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. So they were rather fatherly towards um, a, a female sales rep. And the receptionist would show me back into the doctor's office. And while I waited for him, I didn't pick up Red Book or Women's Day. I grabbed either a medical book off the shelf or I'd pick up one of the journals on his desk and sit there and read articles. So when they saw I was interested, they taught me medicine back before managed care. One of my doctors told me, he said, ah, if you listen to the care, if you listen carefully, the patient will tell you what's wrong with them. <laughs> and then if you listen really carefully, the patient will tell you how to get them better. So these guys were just amazing mentors for 16 years. And then we were moving so my husband could go to chiropractic college. And my girlfriend reminded me of my interest in medicine. And she said, that's really dumb. You want to be a doctor. You always have. I said, yeah, but I've got a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. How am I going to do that? So the, the lunch was on Saturday morning, Sunday. I went to church with the two kids and the minister was giving a, a sermon on vocations. And in the middle of that sermon, she said, if there is a what in your life that you're called to do and you're clear about the what, you do that and let God worry about how. How is not your job. God will take care of that. And I went, and it was like this door I had closed on myself 10 years before, because I was about 28 the last time I tried to go back to pre-med and hold a full-time job. This door I'd closed on myself when I was 28 or 29 just went slamming open. And I picked up the kids after church and I went home and I told my husband, guess what? I'm going to go to chiropractic college too. And he said, how? I said, I don't know. That's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> so we packed up. We didn't pack up. The movers packed up a moving van and um, moved us to Portland. And uh, we started pre-med. Um, and I wasn't sure how we were going to do it. We had some inheritance money. Um, and then my dad that I hadn't talked to in like five or six years, it was a little strained relationship. But I called him just to let him know that we were driving up the California coast to uh, to Portland and we got to talking about the plan and and I said, well, he said, well, how are you going to do this? I said, well, he's going to go for four years and then when he graduates, I'll go and he'll work and that's how we'll do it. And he said, well, that's going to take a long time. I said, well, yeah, but, you know, and he said, well, I need a local, he was a produce packer in Idaho. And um, so he sold potatoes to like grocery stores and um, produce markets. And he said, I need a sales rep 
in Portland that'll call on the markets and the just make phone calls during the week. Don't have to actually go out, just file a report and uh, tell them about, you know, my company and the product and see what you can do. And I said, great. So he provided enough income that I could start pre-med. I started pre-med at Portland State when I was 40 and um, did pre-med for two years then started chiropractic college when I was 42. Um, I did well enough in pre-med and the MCATs that I had an interview to get into medical school when I was 42 instead of going to chiropractic college. And um, interviews are usually pretty easy, but that interview felt sticky. It just wasn't comfortable. Um, I interviewed uh, with two doctors in one day from OHSU. I had to stay in Portland. And um, the inter both interviews came down to uh, the fact that I was 42 years. How was I going to do medical school? Because I was 42 years old with a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. How are you going to do this? What are the children going to say? And it's like, I don't know. And so I, there were, we were interviewing for the January class. There were sleep, three slots and six of us. And so I didn't, didn't get chosen. And the admissions director for OHSU was a real, um, was really supportive. And he said, no, Carol, you should, you should go back to Portland State and re-interview next year. And I said, John, next year I'm going to be 43 with two little kids. This is not going to get better. <laughs> and uh, so I went back to um, Mount Hood Community College, took geology and anatomy and physiology for fun and started chiropractic college in the fall. And um, I dropped out of school to take care of my mom when she got pancreatic cancer. I got divorced. So chiro finishing chiropractic college took five years. And um, so I graduated when I was 47. And by then I had met and partnered with a, a chiropractor who was a teacher at school named George Douglas. And when I started practice, I bought a practice. I started the practice. Um, George gave me a two channel microcurrent machine. And um, it's called the Precision Micros analog machine and a blue box. We call it, they called it the blue box. And uh, back then, microcurrent was just used with, mostly with probes, sometimes with sticky pads, but mostly with probes, stimulate acupuncture points and to use the current, just three tenths of a hertz or six tenths of a hertz, just some sort of current flow uh, through the joint to help with local pain. So I used that in 94. And in 95, I had a patient um, that had myofascial trigger points in her calf, in her uh, gastrox, in her calf muscle. She was a runner. And um, I had learned trigger point therapy when I was in school. And so I started working on her gastrox with my thumbs, which is what you do for trigger points. Um, just you, you press and hold and then release and then press and hold and release and press and hold and release. Well, after about, so she came in with her pain at about a four. After about, I don't know, 10 minutes of this, her pain went up to a seven or an eight. And it's like, okay, that's never happened before. That's bad. And since George had been a teacher at school, um, of course, I, I called him. I said, hang on just one second to the patient. Called George and said, what do I do? And he said, have you got the blue box there, the, the microcurrent? I said, yeah. He said, okay, use sticky pads, put four pads on it and set 18 on hertz on channel A and 62 hertz on channel B. And I said, what's that for? And he said, I'll tell you if it works. <laughs> so I went in, I put the sticky pads on her leg. I ran 18 hertz on channel A, 62 hertz on channel B. And her pain went from a seven to a zero. And the trigger point was gone. And so 
we said goodbye. And I went back and called George. I said, what did I just do? He said, well, I think you broke a blood vessel in her leg when <laughs> you were using your thumbs. Oh. Because 18 hertz on channel A is the frequency to stop bleeding. And 62 hertz on channel B is the frequency for the artery. And I said, what frequency? And he said, well, it's from the list. What list? And it turns out that, oh, let's see. How's that? If you want me to keep talking, this story can go on for a while. Oh, is that okay? I'm on the edge of my seat. Oh, okay. So I said, what list? And he said, well, Harry's list. Harry who? Okay, that takes us back to a, an osteopath and naturopath from England named Harry Van Gelder. He moved to the U.S. or to North America, he moved to Canada in 1946. Now, and he bought a practice. He walked into that practice and there in the back room, there was this thing under a sheet. He pulled the sheet off and there's this machine. And the machine had a list, a paper list of frequencies under it. So the background on that machine was that back in the early 1900s, starting at about 1910, 1908, medical physicians and osteopaths were using electromagnetic therapies, so frequency devices that delivered current modulated at specific vibrational rates or frequencies. That started to be done in 1908, 1910. Um, 19, uh, 1910, the medical profession created the Flexner Report, which was to standardize medical practice. Back in 1910, there were no medical schools. If you wanted to get trained, you went and worked in somebody's office and learned medicine from a doctor that was a doctor, or you went to Vienna and went and trained there but there were no medical schools. There was no standardized medical practice. People used herbs, homeopathy, tonics, opiates, whatever. And the Flexner Report was an attempt to standardize medical practice. So about 1917, I think there was an addendum to it and that said, okay, look, drugs and surgery and radiation, those we know work. And back then, there was also the budding pharmaceutical industry that came around about 1910, 1914. So drugs and surgery were to be the tools of medicine, and everything else was not a great idea. So they lived with that for a number of years. And then finally, in 1934, they got serious. 1934, the uh, I think the FDA had been created by then, and the American Medical Association is what granted the license to practice. So in 1934, they decreed that drugs and surgery were the only tools, legitimate tools of medicine, and that herbs, homeopathy, nutrition, and electromagnetic therapies um, were outlawed. And any medical physician that used them would lose their license to practice, which at that time was granted by the AMA. So the machines went on the junk heap. The research all stopped. They, I mean, back in the in the teens and the 1920s, there were medical research societies, Electromedical Digest and the Pathometric Society. There was meetings and journals and a lot written and shared about how these physicians came up with these frequencies to use on these machines. 1934, the machines went on the junk heap, went into the back room, got covered up by the sheet. Harry Van Gelder comes over from the UK and buys a practice in 1946 walks into the back room and there is a machine that was built in 1922 and that machine comes with a list of frequencies. 
He taught himself how to use it. He used herbs, homeopathy. He was an osteopath and naturopath. He used herbs, homeopathy, osteopathic adjusting. He stimulated acupuncture points. He used nutrition. He adjusted the spine. He was like the full meal deal. And he got quite a reputation all over Canada uh, for fixing people that nobody else could fix. Tumors and cancer were easy for him. He said, that's just not that hard. Um, and um, back when Robert Rowan, who had a, I don't know if he still has it, but he has a newsletter called Second Opinion. He wrote one of his newsletters that told people that I had Harry's list of frequencies. Well, I live in Portland and Harry practiced in Portland for, I think, 10 years. So I had Harry's patients coming out of the wall, coming out of the woodwork. I had 30 phone calls. I probably saw six or 10 people. And among those people were he, were people whom he had cured of colon cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, kidney cancer, ocular cancer. Just That was just their story about and. I told them I wasn't Harry. I didn't treat cancer. I was really sorry. It was nice to meet them. And we bid adieu. So George Douglas knew Harry from um, his medical and his theosophical associations. So Theosophical Society is a philosophical group that brought Eastern thought to the West. And so Harry knew George from there, and or George knew Harry from there. George Douglas went down to Ojai, California, where Harry was practicing in 1983, and preceptored or followed Harry around for three months. And when he came home in 1983, he came home with the list of frequencies written on pieces of binder paper, basically and put them in a drawer. And then in 1995, when I broke that blood vessel in the patient's calf, treating a trigger point with my thumbs, he, he had found the list and he looked on the list and he saw the frequency 18 hertz to stop bleeding and 62 hertz for arteries. So, that was the list. And we started using it on my fibromyalgia and myofascial pain patients in 1995. Um, I'd done a continuing education lecture for Portland State in 1995. And so I kind of became the local expert. You give a lecture and then the people you teach send you their patients that you've just lectured about. So I had all these fibromyalgia and myofascial pain patients to practice on. So 95, 96, by the September of 96, our outcomes in myofascial pain and even fibromyalgia were just unbelievable. They're just too good to be true. So I really had to find out if it was reproducible. Was it, was the frequency effect real or was it a, a, complicated placebo effect because I was a nice guy and, you know, the walls in the clinic were pink. And first time I taught it was January of 1997. Um, there were about 20, 25 students, about six or eight of them bought the precision microcurrent machine from Doug Casey, who was the local distributor. And by June of 97, we knew it was reproducible. So I kept teaching it mostly because it would be immoral not to. So 97, we treated mostly myofascial trigger points and myofascial pain. I published the first paper in 1998 because I came out of allopathic medicine. Basically, unless something has been published, it never happened. Right. So I published 50 cases of chronic head, neck, and face pain. Um, average chronicity was eight years. 
incoming pain level was a seven, outgoing pain at the end of, uh, took 11 sessions in eight weeks to get their pain down to a, a 1.5. And that was really because I didn't know what I was doing. Now it's much easier because we know that you have to treat the the underlying pathology that drives the muscles to be tight. But back then we thought we were treating muscles. Um, and then 98 stumbled like literally on a way to treat nerve pain. So when you think about somebody with sciatica or a disc bulge in their neck that's making their hand hurt, what tissue is causing that? So that's what the list had on it. There was a list of conditions that you put on one channel and there was a list of tissues that you would put on the other channel. So myofascial pain is from the muscle belly and the fascia and the connective tissue. Nerve pain is from the nerve. So there was a frequency for the nerve. And then what's wrong with the nerve? Well, it acts like it's inflamed. And on the list, there was a frequency for that just said inflammation, 40 hertz. Well, we made the assumption that it was not to increase inflammation. So we assumed that the frequencies were all to neutralize the condition for which they were listed. So to treat nerve pain in 1998, I tried 40 hertz on channel A to reduce inflammation, 396 hertz on channel B to address or treat the nerve. And nerve pain turned out to be easy. You put one contact where the nerve exits the spine and you put the other contact at the end of the nerve and nerves love to be polarized. It's just how they work. And you polarize the current positive and in any place from 15 to 60 minutes, they're out of pain. Does it hurt? And when they go through the therapy, is there a sensation? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no. As a matter of fact, it is micro amperage current. So that's millions of an amp. Um, by comparison, like a TENS device is milliamps. It's thousands of an amp. And the TENS devices make it buzz and tingle and muscles contract and all of that stuff. This is... 1,000 times less current than tens. So you can't feel it. You can't, there's no sensation whatsoever. Um, as a matter of fact, that was a problem. Microcurrent was first introduced in the 1970s and was used pretty widely through the late 70s, 80s. By the early 90s, though, the physical therapy community had been told that because you couldn't feel it, it couldn't be doing anything <laughs> and um, it was not effective. So it just like almost overnight within four or five years, it just fell out of favor, it just wasn't used much. Um, but what they know about the current by itself, because it's physiologic, your body produces current. If you put a, a measuring device at your at your head and another one at your feet, there is current flow between your head and your feet. If you put a measuring device at your spine and you measure out to your fingers, there is current flow between your spine and your fingers. Your body makes current on its own mm -hmm. and it's current in the micro amperage range. So back in 1982, Nok Chang was a PhD, I think he was a physiologist, but he did the first animal tissue study on microamperage current and microcurrent, just the current flow, increased ATP or energy production in cells by 500%, by five times. Wow. In something like 30 minutes. And if you took the current up, so that was anything below 500 microamps, which is still subsensory, you can't feel it. Between 500 and 1,000 microamps, the 
ATP production leveled off and by a, anything above 1,000 micrograms, ATP production actually dropped. So by the time you get to tens level current that you can feel, you're actually reducing ATP or energy in the cells. So you can't feel it. What we found in 1998, well, actually in even in 97, what we found is when the frequencies are correct, the only, the only side effect is that people get stoned. It's like they get, Jeff Bland calls it this induced euphoria. They get kind of floaty and um, drifty and just, it's really quite pleasant. Um, and it's legal in all 50 <laughs> states. <laughs> so... Um, 98, we found out how to treat nerve pain. And then 99, I was asked to join a medical pain management group in Northwest Portland. And when I got there, it, there was a whole new level of pain. It was a whole new level of patient complexity. And that was the first place that I saw a patient that had full body pain, mm. fibromyalgia, pain level was between a seven and a nine. Um, muscles were tight. Uh, you couldn't touch your skin without it being painful enough that she would break into a sweat. And I felt her neck and just said, wow, this is, this is not normal. And she's got this kind of pain all over her body following an auto accident that happened six years, seven years before. I was like, well, what carries pain all over the body? Well, the spinal cord. And I looked on the list and there was a frequency for the spinal cord. It's like, wow, okay. What would be wrong with the spinal cord that would create pain all over the body? Well, Frequency to reduce inflammation works for the nerve, so maybe it'll work for the spinal cord too. So I put 40 hertz on channel A and 10 hertz on channel B. And she had pain from basically her neck to her toes. So I, I took one contact, which back then were graphite gloves. Now we use uh, wet fabric wraps or, or even little hand towels, wrapped it around the neck. And then put the other contacts on her feet. And the first thing that happened was that she got really relaxed and just, I was treating her sitting up, leaned her back up against me. And then she got so floaty that we had to lay her down. And the pain receded from her feet up. It took 60 minutes. And at the end of that time, her pain was a one. Oh my gosh. That was my reaction. Good word. Oh my gosh. And I said, I don't know if it's going to last. This is the first time I've done this. Wow. So she came back a week later and it had lasted for about two days and then it came back. So I treated her five or six times at the pain clinic, but she drove over from the coast in Portland uh, sorry, in Oregon, the Oregon coast, it was about a two and a half hour drive and it was just too much. So she stopped coming. But once I learned to recognize the patient, the history and the way the tissue felt and what the physical exam was, I, by the end of the year, we had 25 of these between my practice out in East Portland and this pain clinic. So um, I left the pain clinic of, I think, around September, October. I didn't stay the full year. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's another story on its own. <laughs> so in October, I went to um, a continuing education conference, and I met a, a colleague from Western States Chiropractic College who worked at um, the car, what is it called? European college, European, 
CC, a Anglo, Anglo-European chiropractic college in Bournemouth in England. So we had a nice chat and I said, man, I am doing this cool stuff with this just impossible group of patients. And I told him about the patients that come in with full body pain that's a seven and one hour later they're a one. And it's the only frequency that works to do that is 40 hertz on channel A and 10 hertz on channel B. He said, wow, we're doing a, a pain a spinal trauma conference in Bournemouth, England in March, February, something like that. Um, would you would you come over and present these cases? So I wrote up the case report, but I had to find a mechanism. Like, what is it about a disc injury that would make the spinal cord react so badly? I was telling patients that it was like they had an amplifier built in at this disc place where this disc was, disc bulge, because they all had disc bulges in their neck following the accident. They weren't surgical. So it wasn't a herniation. It was a, a disc bulge. And then I delved into the medical literature and found out that the discs in your spine are chemically active. They're inflammatory. It is base, the nucleus inside the disc is the biologic equivalent of battery acid. Mm. And so it's very inflammatory. And then I researched some more in the literature in this journal called Spine. And it turns out that the nucleus pulposus by itself when it was tested in animals, and then this chemical that's in the nucleus called phospholipase A2 in four separate studies, those those two pro, uh, substances would strip the myelin off a nerve it, in 28 days. Hmm. It demyelinates or damages the nerve. And then I looked at the anatomy of it, and this disc is in between the spinal vertebra and the pain pathways in the spinal cord are lateral part of the spinal cord, and most disc injuries are on the posterior lateral side of the disc. So this chemical injury from the disc hits the spinal cord, they're less than two millimeters apart, and it just strips the myelin. So it's and then I researched some more. So this is all happening on the weekend in my clinic as I'm trying to figure out why this works. And the disc injury didn't amplify the pain. It stopped it. The disc injuries in the neck disrupt conduction in the pain pathways in the spinal cord. And then I looked in my favorite neurology book, and it said that if you disrupt transmission in the pain pathways in the spinal cord, you end up with um, what is effectively thalamic pain syndrome, which is what people get after strokes. And then you read the descriptions of thalamic pain syndrome. It's what these fibromyalgia patients had been describing to me for a year. Oh. And so when you reduce the inflammation, so phospholipase A2 is incredibly inflammatory. It is just, it's, it's incredibly inflammatory. It really is like biological battery acid. And so when we reduce the inflammation caused by the phospholipase A2 in the spinal cord, 10, pain goes down. So I put together these slides, and this was probably... This was October. I started figuring this out. And then a month later, one of my one of the people that I'd been in touch with from the myofascial pain world was an MD from the National Institutes of Health by the name of Jay Shaw. And he had come to the course because he had an interest professionally and personally in the treatment of myofascial trigger points. 
And so he happened to be in 1999, which is when all this was happening. He happened to be in charge of recruiting speakers for the ground rounds to the researchers at NIH in Building 10, which is their main continuing ed grand rounds place. And he said, I have an opening in March or April for a speaker. Um, I just had a cancellation. Would you come and present these cases at NIH? I said, I would love to, because at this point, I had 25 by the time I got to NIH, I had 46 of them. I, by Dece It was clear. I'd done it 25 times, and it was also clear that nobody would believe me because the changes were too big. Mm -hmm. And we started trying to find or figure out what, what objective you could measure. Pain score didn't count because pain is so subjective. What You can't do it electrically because there's no electrical measure Nerve conduction doesn't work in the spinal cord. So I get to NIH, I present all these cases at this point, there's 40 of them. So it pretty much never doesn't work. 43 patients, they walk in with their pain as an average, someplace between a five and a 10, five and a nine. So at an average of 7.3, they leave at an average of a 1.3. And that's looked at this group of 30 guys in white coats and pocket protectors and crossed arms. And I said, you guys are the best scientists in the country. Somebody help me figure out what we can measure with this. There's got to be some objective change. So Terry Phillips was a micro immunochemist from uh, George Washington University that had just been recruited to go to work for NIH. So he'd been there with his equipment for less than six weeks. So he didn't know that he was about to break a number of NIH regulations. <laughs> when he came up to me and he said, you get me a spot of blood on blotter paper and I can tell you what they had for breakfast. And it's like, okay. So he sent me the blotter paper and I called the patient that we had treated in 97 and 98 and we couldn't help her. And she'd had, since then, she'd had spinal surgery, but she still had full body pain. Mm -hmm. And I called her up and I said, we've got this new thing that we're doing that might help you. And I'm, I, I will treat you for free but I need to be able to poke your finger and put a spot of blood on this, on this paper. She said, honey, you can do anything you want. Pricking my finger is nothing compared to what this feels like on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So she came in and we did a blood sample at 10 minutes to 11 on a Friday. And we did another one at 20 after when her, pain was gone in her legs. It recedes from the feet up for some reason. Well, we know why it recedes from the feet up. It's because the homunculus, the organization of neurons in the pain pathways, have the feet closest to the disc. So the feet and leg pain goes first, then the trunk pain, and in uh, 70 minutes by noon, she was completely pain-free and totally stoned. So at about 20 to 12, she looked up at me and she said, is this legal? <laughs> I said, yeah, so far. So, and then between 12 and 1230, there was another protocol that Harry Van Gelder used. We call the concussion protocol. And it treats the medulla. It just, it has a really interesting and profound effect on patients. So when her pain was a zero at 12, I switched and ran the concussion protocol between 12 and 12.30 and did blood samples at 12 and 12.30. So we had these five or six blood spots and I sent them off, marked them up, you know, identified them with pencil and sent them to Terry. And that was uh, March, April, probably late March, early April. And 
at the end of May, I was supposed to present these same 46 cases at um, the Institute for Functional Medicine annual symposium. Their international symposium was held once a year at the end of May. And um, at, literally, as I was heading out of the office to catch a plane to go to Phoenix to, to present these cases in a the lecture was titled uh, Energy Medicine in Clinical Practice. Um, the fax machine goes off, and it's Terry from NIH with the raw data. And there were initials. I knew what they meant. Interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha. These are all inflammatory cytokines and peptides. Interferon gamma, CGRP substance P, which is a peptide that um, created in the spinal cord that mediates the transmission of pain, um, endorphins. And this was 19, this is the early 2000. So I just acquired email the year before. There was no Google, there was no um, Wikipedia. So I get to the hotel in Phoenix and Jeff Bland's walking out and um, I'm walking in and I've got this data sheet in my hand. I'm trying to, okay, so the numbers are changing, but is this a big deal? Is this easy to do? Is this significant? I had no idea. So Jeff is walking out towards me and I said, oh, I'm so glad to see you. Look at the data we just got from Terry Phillips at NIH. Now, Dr. Bland's a PhD biochemist. I think most of your listeners would have heard of the Institute for Functional Medicine or Functional Medicine. Well, Jeff is the guy that started it right. 35 years ago. Right. And so Jeff takes this sheet of paper and he's looking at me and then he looks down at the sheet of paper and his hands start shaking. That was my first clue. And then he said, wow you're going to knock their socks off with this tomorrow because my lecture was the next day. I said, yeah, I'd love to, but I have no idea what these things mean. Is this, yes, they're big changes, but is that normal? He said, you know, call Michael Ruff. He's at GW. He works with Candace Pert. So they wrote together the molecules of emotion. Mm -hmm. And he said, he is arguably the leading expert on cytokines in the United States. He'll be able to tell you. Okay. So I called Michael Ruff and I said, Dr. Ruff, Dr. Bland said to, to talk to you. And, and, um, and I've got these, the cytokine data and I, I, I'm not sure whether or not it's significant. And he said, yeah, okay. What are the numbers? And I said, well, interleukin one goes from 392 down to 26. And he said, it's like the the phone got really quiet. <laughs> and he said, what time frame? I said, 90 minutes. He said, that's not possible. Cytokines are hard to change. And, and when they change, they change slowly. And I said, no, they don't. No, they're not hard to change. They all change like that. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, TNF alpha, I'm actually opening up a slide presentation so I can read the numbers and get them right. Um, and I'll look, TNF alpha went from uh, 299 down to 20. And he, he sort of squeaked. He said, in 90 minutes? And I said, yeah. He said, what else? TNF alpha goes from 299 down to 20. Interleukin 6 goes from 204 down to 15. Um, and CGRP went down. These are going down by factors of 10 and 20 times in 90 minutes. And he said, that's un impossible, unheard of. Who did your data? And I said, Terry Phillips, the same guy that does your data. He <laughs> said, well, he's the best in the world. And it's like, he said, I don't. How did you do this? And I told him about the microcurrent and the pain and the frequencies. And he said, I have no idea what you're doing, but keep doing it and keep me posted. So then we went to the speaker's dinner last night and David Perlmutter was also on the 
on the podium. And so he, it was a, he was at the d dinner and I'm, I got this folded up piece of paper with these numbers on it. And, um, and he said, well, does subs did they measure substance P? Substance P is made in the spinal cord. Because I said 40 hertz on channel A is reduced inflammation and 10 is the spinal cord. And he said, well, substance P changes, then you really are treating the spinal cord. I said, funny you should mention, substance P goes down from 132 down to 10. That's a 10-fold decrease in an hour and 45 minutes. It's not possible. And then Jeff pointed to the data and said, yeah, and look at what the endorphins do. The endorphins go up from 5 to 88. He said, you'd have to run all day to get those kind of, because that's endorphins are what cause the runner high. And that's right. what changes we think that's causing people to get so stoned. So that is still the most significant and amazing data since then. I've probably treated 350 um, patients. The paper was published in um, 2005. We submitted it to five different journals before we got uh, JBMT and Leon Chetow to accept it. Um, it was 54 patients with a history of some sort of spine trauma. Average chronicity was 10 years. Incoming pain was a 7.3 on narcotics. Mm. Um, exiting pain was a 1.3. And 58% of them, so it was 54 patients, one of them had um, some spinal cord stenosis, so she didn't tolerate the treatment. But... Um, 58%, 31 of the 53% of the 53 patients, their fibromyalgia was gone in four months. Each time you treated them, the pain went down faster and stayed gone longer. Um, 13 of the 53 discontinued treatment for reasons not related to treatment side effects. So there were no side effects aside from the fact that you got stoned and your pain went away. But so it took me probably 10 years to figure out what was up with these 13 out of 53 patients. We had the same problem in, when we treat nerve pain. What's up with that? And then it occurred to me that when we treat somebody, if you've been in pain for like any place between three and 50 years, if your pain level has not been below a five or a six for 15 years and you are pain free at the end of 60 minutes, who are you? Mm. Right? We have the ability with this technology in many conditions, not just fibromyalgia and myofascial pain, nerve pain, to create an identity crisis that is literally unparalleled in medicine. So there's, there's no, I don't think there's any medication that I can think of except maybe an antibiotic when you're really sick that turns you from really sick to normal in 60 to 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. It takes repeated treatment. The 58% that recovered 50, what was it? The f yeah, 58% that recovered um, came into the clinic twice a week for about six to eight weeks and then gradually decrease their visits. There happened to be just a little microcurrent device available that had two channels that happened to have a frequency choice that included 40 and 10. So a number of patients bought those from um, was a company called Rehabilicare, bought those and used them at home. Um, one, one patient is sort of our our uh, poster child had fibromyalgia for se 17 years. Um, she started out in on December 8th with uh, 
18 out of 18 tender points tender to less than one or two pounds per square inch pressure. By January 8th, one month later, she had um, 14 out of 18 tender points tender to maybe two or three pounds per square inch pressure. By February, she had four out of 18 tender points and she no and she was sleeping well with no medication. She no longer met the diagnostic criteria for fibromyalgia. She didn't have it anymore. She was off all her meds. Um, and so I think she was with me for, for the four months, but she didn't have fibromyalgia after the two months. I got her into PT. We, she had to recondition, stabilize her spine. She got massages. I'm a chiropractor, so I did adjusting uh, with a, an activator, a really light force sort of technique. And at the end of four months, she was she was done, and it was permanent. Six years later, I found her. She had moved to Colorado, and it she was fine. So that was the beginning. And since then, we have expanded. So, oh, like, because I have this list, there are all kinds of tissues, the liver, small intestine, kidney, um, the ureter, the bladder, the joint capsule, the cartilage. There's frequencies on this list for this condition. Well, it took me, I'm pretty skeptical, believe it or not. <laughs> and it, it took me five years treating roughly 70 to 90 patient visits a week. Clinic was total chaos at that point. I never ran on time. But doing 70 to 90 patient visits a week for five years. So we figured it was around 30,000 to 40,000 patient treatments, individual treatments that I did myself in a five-year period. It took me five years to believe that the frequencies always do what they're described as doing. So if I make a choice that doesn't work, it's not that the frequencies aren't working, it's that I pick the wrong thing. So, um, yeah, so when somebody came in with elevated liver enzymes, you treat inflammation in the liver and the enzymes go down. Somebody comes in with an ovarian cyst. So in Oregon, chiropractors can do deliver babies, do GYN exams. Um, so somebody comes in with a huge ovarian cyst and low back pain and abdominal pain. And the ovarian cyst is the size of an orange or a grapefruit. You run the frequency to reduce inflammation in the ovary. And you just like literally, you could palpate the cyst mm. shrinking. Wow. So over time, we've found out what we can treat, what we can't treat. The frequencies to reduce inflammation and dissolve scar tissue are the ones that are the most reliable. It's like, those. that's a slam dunk. If it's in, inflammatory, we can treat it. Then there are frequencies on a whole additional sheet from another one of Harry's lists that we teach in the advanced. and. It's all been clinically derived. Everything I teach in the what we call the core seminar. The core seminar start, started out as two, two days, two short days, like from nine to five, nine to six. It is now four days, four full days. We start at nine. We go to six. We're never finished till 6.30. Um, and Sunday afternoon is all the visceral applications. Um, but we do physical medicine, muscles, nerve, new injuries. So um, 1990, probably was 2000, patient came in that she called me at 8.30 in the morning and she said, I just got, in an accident, um, 
I was going through an intersection. My car was hit side impact at 30 miles an hour, just behind the driver's side door. My minivan fell over, like tipped on its side. She climbed out of the car, called me, called her husband, called a tow truck. They went to the emergency. I said, just get to the office as soon as you can. Um, so she went to the emergency room, found out nothing was fractured. She was okay. But when she got to my office at 1130, so three hours after the accident, her range of motion was about 20% of normal. She had pain level was a six or a seven. She had pain in her neck, her shoulders, the lower part of her face. She was a podiatrist uh, as a profession, but she was also a dancer with the Portland Ballet Company. So she had, what, maybe 12% body fat, really slender, very flexible, strong, but flexible. And so you could actually see the swelling in the muscles in her neck. She couldn't move her head. I mean, it was awful. So I did the exam um, and I started treating her at 1230 and I treated her with the frequencies to stop the bleeding. Um, There are frequencies for torn and broken and removing the the fact of trauma from connective tissue, ligaments, all, all the discs, all the tissues that get injured in an auto accident. So I treated her from 1230, 1.30, 2 o'clock, so an hour and a half. And then George came in and treated her from 2 to 3. And he, he did basically the same thing, but on the tissues I hadn't gotten to yet. Um, and we treated the nervous system. And um, so at 3 o'clock, I went in and I, I looked at her and I said, okay, here's the thing. It's going to be worse tomorrow than it is today. It's going to be worse the day after that than it is tomorrow. And it's going to take you three to four months to recover. This is a big deal. This is a, this is a really massive accident. And she said, okay. So this was a Thursday. And I said, come in tomorrow morning. So she came in the next day, nine o'clock in the morning, completely pain-free with full range of motion. No. That oh is exactly what I said. It's like, what? What about the inflammation? It was like, yeah, it was like watching the sun come up in the west. It's like, huh? I said, well, maybe the pain will come back Monday. I don't know. <laughs> it's on vacation. Came, yeah, right. I was like, I, whatever. It's hiding out. So Monday she comes in pain-free, full range of motion. And that kind of went on a shelf with things I didn't understand, but had to try it again. So over time, for between 2000 and 2004, we found out that they had to be treated within four hours to six hours of the time of the injury. Mm. And after six to eight hours, if it was as long as 12 hours, it speeded things up, but it wasn't miraculous. So... And we don't get that many patients that are that acute. So in 2003, I taught a sports seminar. And in June, I was teaching the core seminar with Metagenics as a sponsor. And I was up in San Francisco and somebody heard about me from one of my students. And so I ended up treating the entire uh, offensive line from the San Francisco 49ers and Terrell Owens and Tony Parrish were in that group of six, eight guys that I treated that day. So in December of 2004, when Terrell Owens injured his ankle and fractured his tibia, fibula, his trainer called me on December 19th in the morning, his personal trainer, and said, Terrell got hurt yesterday. Um, It's bad. We've been treating him with microcurrent with the sports care unit. And um, he wants to play in the Super Bowl in six weeks. And Mike Hatrock, who's his chiropractor, who's my student, Hatrock said he's not going to do it. It's too scary. 
And he said, if any's going to, but he's going to do it, you're going to do it. And I said, I kind of did the math in my head and took a deep breath and said, yeah, let's say we can, it's worth a try. So I said, but I have to be there when he gets out of surgery tomorrow morning. Cause I knew about the four hour window. They had gotten microcurrent on him right after the fracture. And I said, I've got to treat him because they were going in surgically to pin, because not only did he fracture the fibula, he tore the ligaments, mm. avulsed the ligaments on the outside part of the angle, ankle, and he tore the connective tissue um, membrane that holds the tibia and the fibula together. There was nothing holding his lower leg together. So they went in and they, they pinned the tibia and the fibula together. And they just kind of paced down the deltoid ligament on the outside of the ankle and ankle and put him in a stitch it up, put him in a boot. And I was there when he got out of the OR. I had my big old blue box, weighed 14 pounds, eight D cell batteries. And I started treating him in the car on the way home because what we were about to attempt was completely impossible. Just can't be done. So he came in the house on crutches and I set up the microcurrent machine on the, on the coffee table in the living room. He went to the bathroom, crutched his way back over to the couch, had a glass of water, laid down on the couch, and I treated him for 24 hours straight. That was 10 o'clock in the morning when we got to the house. Um, we just sat on the couch. They brought us food and when it was bedtime, I slept sitting up, he slept on the couch. I treated him, I turned the current down because I was gonna treat him overnight. And I just ran the frequencies to stop the bleeding, quiet down the inflammation in the nerve, repair the bone, uh, treat the tissue for being torn and broken. So the next morning, team trainer for the Philadelphia Eagles comes in the house and he said, okay, let's see it. And so Terrell's in a, in a, one of those Velcro, what you put on your leg when it breaks boots. So we undid the Velcro and we cut the gauze wrap. And what we should have seen was an ankle that was about the size of a football. It should have been incredibly swollen, black, purple, even on an African-American athlete, it should have been black. And there was zero swelling and zero bruising. And all three of us looked at it and just went, wow. And Burkholder said, how do I take advantage of what you can do? And I said, well, you're going to have to believe what you see <laughs> instead of what you expect to see, because I've never done anything like this before. This is, this is nuts. So it's like, okay. So we treated him for six hours a day, uh, five or six days a week for five weeks. And at the end of four weeks, the fracture, which was an open spiral fracture in the fibula, was completely healed, bone to bone, remodeled, done. The surgeon was running, running around telling anybody with a microphone that this was an 18 week injury. He'd never play. He might never play again. And he wouldn't clear him to practice. <sighs> and Burkholder said, I'll fix that. So he did fluoroscopy and x-rays and the ankle was completely stable on fluoroscopy and the fracture was healed. Now, Burkholder had him, he had no pain, no swelling, no bruising. I treated him on the 19th, uh, 20th, 21st, I guess, 21st, 22nd, 23rd. I flew home Christmas Eve. He had Christmas Day off. And on the 26th of December, Burkholder had him in a swimming pool, running on a treadmill, put a Ziploc baggie on his leg up to his hip and had him running in three feet of water for an hour because he had to stay aerobically fit. We not only had to repair the ankle, he had to be fit to play. Mm -hmm. So make a long story short, at four weeks, it was completely healed. 
And the frequencies for taking apart scar tissue are so powerful that I knew I couldn't use them until the injury was six weeks old, five and a half. So I didn't do anything to take apart the scar tissue until we got to Jacksonville for the Super Bowl. And when he got to Jacksonville on Tuesday, he couldn't run. He ran 20 yards and his whole lower leg cramped up, his foot cramped up. I got there Wednesday and his massage therapist, Brian Glotzbach, and I spent five hours taking apart his lower leg down to the bone. Brian still describes it as bloodless surgery. It was nuts. <laughs> All of the, because in order to run, you, those tissues have to glide. And if it's stuck to the bone or the nerve or the muscle, cerebellum is not going to let it run. Mm. So we took it apart on Wednesday, finished it on Thursday. My cat rat came and adjusted his ankle. And he played Sunday like he'd never been hurt. So that's kind of the long answer to the question you asked an hour ago. Oh my gosh, you are now my number one favorite guest when it comes to storytelling. <laughs> oh, all I want to do is like come hang out with you. I <laughs> love it. I have so many questions. I'm on the edge of my seat the entire time. <laughs> I have so much respect for what you do. Oh, thank you. Well, the, I know the listeners are just like me on the edge of their seat. I've actually, I have a list of notes of like questions that came up, you know, sure. and then on the side of the paper, I have a list of people I'm going to immediately call after we're done this interview <laughs> to tell them that they have to have to have to have this or they have to have it in their life. Um, yeah. when you, let's go way back to the beginning. You, 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 sure. you mentioned briefly the Flexner report and I think what's really right. important for people to understand is that was the sort of modernization of our current medical system. And it was funded right. by, wasn't it Carnegie? Yes. And Merck. They funded it in order to make a list of doctors that would use their pharmaceuticals. So the entire right. American medical establishment was basically uh, manipulated uh, and formed by the interest to profit pharmaceuticals yep right and so of course they want to kick out anything that competes with pharmaceutical you know interests yeah. and right. this type of so i i know about the rife machine and i read the you know the book the story on the rife machine and how mm -hmm. they um the rife machine was so effective at reducing you know, killing tumors and things like that and killing, you know, infections that it was outlawed because that is going way against the interests of the pharmaceutical companies. And this sounds very similar to the Rife machine. Can you explain the difference between what you do and what the Rife machine does? Sure. The uh, Rife used a light microscope. So he developed a microscope in whenever that was, 1920 something, that was so powerful, he could see life forms um, and infectious agents that we, we still haven't replicated his device. Mm -hmm. And he found, and it was a light microscope, he found that when he tuned the light to a certain frequency, because light has frequencies that are between eight and 16,000 hertz, when he tuned the light in the microscope, the animal, the, the bacteria or the life form would begin to vibrate and then would basically just explode. And so he used light frequencies and he wanted to, he found that there was these bacteria or pleomorphic forms that were associated with cancer and he wanted to accumulate a thousand cases and publish a thousand cases of terminal cancer that he had cured with his um, it was a plasma tube, light frequencies in a plasma tube. And so he never used electrical pulses as light frequencies. And but they shut him down. He had one colleague, one friend in, I think, Southern California that had one of his microscopes and a list of the frequencies. And that was it. There were just the two of them. So when the FDA came in 
and raided Reif's lab. They destroyed, like literally physically destroyed his microscope and the light, confiscated all of his records and the frequency list. And then his other friend just went deep underground. And so they didn't get him. But the lessons of Rife are actually the other reason why I started teaching it. Because they could take out Rife by taking out one guy. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got to 200 practitioners, I figured we were too big to stop. Yes. And then Leon, the publications helped. Rife didn't publish anything. Mm. So I started publishing in 1998. Little case reports, but they're collected case reports and it's better than nothing, right? And then Leon Chetow talked me into, uh, talked to Elsevier into publishing the FSM textbook. And that was published, I think, in 2007 or so, maybe eight. And then, um, so I got it into print, got it out and taught it at first to find out if it was reproducible and to avoid Rife's fate. And then ultimately I kept teaching it because it would be immoral not to. So the basic principles of biologic resonance are the same mm -hmm. as the way the Rife frequencies work. Um, but his free, our frequencies are all below a thousand hertz. They're all used directly on the body. And because I don't want to end up living in Mexico or the Caribbean, we do not treat cancer. Mm -hmm. I just, I can, we can get rid of cancer pain. I can get rid of the nausea from chemotherapy. I can prevent the scarring that happens with radiation burns. Um, I can treat esophageal scarring. There's one sequence of frequencies, uh, probably about six or eight frequency pairs, that's good for metastatic bone pain. So the pain, bone pain from bone metastasis is untreatable with opiates. And there's this one protocol that, so we can treat for pain relief and we can treat to keep the quality of life better with cancer. So that's the biggest difference between Rife and FSM. It's the same basic uh, mechanism, which is um, biological resonance. So your, your body, any life form is um, a um, semiconductor. So the water, now, now I'm off on another tack, oh, but please, this go is ahead. still a good <laughs> story. The water in your cells, so if you took biology, and I, most of us did, they, they show the picture of the cell and they have the organelles like the mitochondria and the nucleus and the ribosomes and all the, the organelles in the cell are kind of, we, we had the idea they were floating around in this liquid that the, the cell is filled with water, basically. And then the biophysicists in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s found out that that water is organized, that it lines this gel matrix that's inside the cell. These water molecules sort of kind of stick electromagnetically to this gel that lines the inside of a cell. And the water molecules flicker as water molecules do. And when they flicker, they form what it, structures that are virtually exactly like the semiconductor that's in your computer. It forms a, a matrix that has a hole that allows the controlled flow of one electron at a time through these holes. So the inside of your cells is like a gummy bear. It's a gel. It's not water. And it's a gel that's a semiconductor. So the current has the ability to affect the 
inside of the cell and the structures on the outside of the cell, the receptors on the cell membrane. So there's two pieces to biological resonance. One is that your body, we think of our bodies as biochemical, right? Because we use nutritional supplements, we take prescription medication, we think of ourselves as biochemical. We, we know that we have, you know, magnesium needs and all these chemicals in us that make us us. Well, the challenge with that is that, yes, we are bio biochemical, but, and as a biochemical system, you obey the rules of Newtonian physics, right? You, if we drop you off a building, you're going to accelerate at 32 feet per second per second. So large structures follow the rules of Newtonian physics. The problem with that is that Newtonian physics falls apart when you get down to the atomic level. So your body is made of biochemicals. Great. What are biochemicals made of? Molecules. Oh, yeah. What are molecules made of? Hmm. Atoms. Uh-huh. What are atoms made of? Oh, subatomic particles. And all of these particles are held together by electromagnetic bonds. There are not special hydrogen atoms in your arm tissue. Make, you know, CH3. It's not a special hydrogen atom. It's the same kind of hydrogen atom that runs around in the linear accelerator in Chicago or CERN. Same, same critter. Okay, so your body is held together. All these atoms, subatomic particles that make up your body are held together by electromagnetic bonds. Got it. That is a fact. There's no wiggle room. That's true. Okay, talk to me about bonds. Every bond, every mechanical bond, every chemical bond, every structural bond, every bond has a frequency at which it resonates. So resonance is, the definition of resonance is the tendency of a system or a bond to oscillate at very large amplitudes in response to some frequencies and not others. At the resonant frequency, very small forces can produce very large amplitude vibrations. So they found out in the 1800s that a company of soldiers or division of soldiers walking across a wooden bridge in step if they hit the right resonant frequency for that bridge, the bridge would collapse. It happened. So when soldiers march across the bridge, they break step. When Julie Andrews in Victor Victoria, when she sings that, that high sustained note. In my chemistry class, the teacher explained why she is able to break a lead crystal glass by singing that one particular precise sustained note. There is a precise frequency that holds lead atoms. It only works with lead crystal that's 70% lead crystal. There is a frequency that literally holds lead atoms together in this crystal matrix. When she sings the note, if she hits it just right, and if it is sustained and perfect, the lead atom bonds begin to vibrate with the singer's note. And eventually, within a minute or so, they vibrate so much that they simply can't hold together and the lead crystal glass comes apart. So that's resonance. So when we talk about the the model that we have for how fsm works now is that there are 
receptors on the outsides of the cells, like just the cell membrane, the outside of the cell membrane is mostly protein, little peptide receptors. And um, those receptors are connected to the inside of the cell by kinases that attach to enzymes that attach to um, kinases that attach to the genes and change what the genes do. So when you take ibuprofen, you take an Advil, that chemical, ibuprofen, lands on this receptor on the outside of a cell and bonds with it chemically like a key in a lock. So drugs and nutrients, even like your nutritional intake, affects the cells. It all works the same way. It affects the cells by landing on that receptor like a key in a lock, and it changes the membrane receptors, and that changes the way the cell works inside. Well, the frequencies, as near as we can tell, affect the same receptors with the signal, like your key fob, you know, your key remote mm -hmm. that opens your car door. That operates on a very specific frequency that is specific to that key and that car. So you notice when you go into a parking lot, you press your key fob and it opens only your car. Not the same year, the same model, a different color that's parked next to you. It's only your car. And that is because the frequency is precise. So the frequencies act as if they are changing cell membrane receptor function and intracellular function like your key fob opens a, a door lock. Because we spent, well, it was probably 12, 15 years, 15 years trying to understand the cytokine data. Remember all the, mm -hmm. the chemicals, the cytokines that changed by factors of 10 and 20 times? And Michael Ruff said that's impossible. They're hard to change and when they change slowly. And they all change by factors of 20 times. The other piece of that is they all stopped in the normal range. So the, the only explanation that makes sense is that the frequency changed the production of cytokines in the spinal cord and substance P in the spinal cord by changing membrane receptor function and changing what the cell did for a living because the cytokines all dropped and they all stopped in the normal range. And the cytokines are produced by this intracellular genetic mechanism. The cytokines don't come from space. They come from inside cells. They're manufactured by the cells. The only way to drop them that fast is by stopping the cell from producing it. It's the only thing that makes sense. That's, and with the new injuries like Terrell and like my auto accident ballerina, when we found out, it's like we didn't understand that mechanism. How do you do that in a new injury? How, does, how did that happen? That is not sensible. That does not happen. And the, as it turns out, the only thing that is unique in brand new injuries is the, the only thing that changes in four to six hours are the genes inside the cell. There are genes that are turned on immediately by bleeding, by inflammation, by tissue fragments, by torn tissue. There are genes that are turned on instantly in the first two hours, and those genes are off at hour six. We think, I mean, this is what started us down the cell signaling pathway. We think that what is happening inside the cells that have been injured 
is that because the frequencies are stopping the bleeding and turning off the inflammation and beginning to repair the tissue and giving the current, giving the cells five times the amount of ATP that it had 20 minutes ago, all of those things work together and turn these genes off. So at the end of the treatment, you're about two weeks into the healing process simply by changing the genes that operate in a new injury. And Tara Owens is living proof that the repair tissue we create is as strong or stronger than what would have happened normally. So, so it has cells, epigenetic changes. Pardon? It's affecting you epigenetically. Yes. That is, that's the only mechanism that accounts for all the data. We have animal data. We have human data. We have now we're working on scar tissue in a rat model in the abdomen. So treating abdominal adhesions and pelvic pain associated with endometriosis and Crohn's and all of that. We've done surgery on rats and watched certain frequencies dissolve scar tissue in certain places in the rat's abdomen and not in other places. And it's very frequency specific. So it's, it is, it's, it's changing the epigenetics. It's the only thing that makes sense. It's the only thing that accounts for all of the data we have. Animal research on inflammation, um, shingles. There's one frequency that the only thing it's good for is shingles, oral and genital herpes and shingles. That doesn't make sense. The patient comes in with pain that you know is shingles. And um, because it follows a nerve root, started from no particular trauma, it's a seven out of 10. You run this one frequency combination and the patient's out of pain in 20 minutes. You have to run it for one to two hours and then it's done. You might have to run it two or three days in a row, but the pain never comes back the, as bad as it was to begin with. And at the end of about six hours of treatment, it's done. The only thing that makes sense, the shingles virus is um, pretty simple as viruses go. It's like uh, about 743 Daltons a peptide that's all held together and about six or eight pretty crucial bonds right in the middle of its little hat, its little head. And all we can think of is that that frequency literally dismantles the virus. It's the only thing that makes any sense of oh, the yeah. data. And we're thousands of patients into this. This one's a slam dunk. How's that, you know? It's the only mechanism that accounts for what we're able to do. That makes complete sense. And that, that was my understanding of, of one of the things that they could do with the Rife machine was basically create the fr frequency that would split apart a bacteria or a virus, much like the the glass, the lead crystal yeah. glass would shatter. You're just doing the exact opposite frequency, canceling it out. It just explodes. It can't hold itself together. Exactly. So it can be destructive to cells you don't want in your body, but Mm -hmm. turn around and support and heal cells you do want to support. That's, that's amazing. Um, why do you think it creates more ATP? Is it because it's somehow stimulating or, or is someone healing the mitochondria or is there a frequency for mitochondria? Like, have you figured out no. why the ATP production goes up so, so much? Um, no, because they, because uh, Nock Chang and then Seegers in South Africa you did two papers, 2001 and 2002. They weren't using any frequency. It's just, that's what is accomplished with just the current. Just microcurrent by itself does an incredible job of, in, uh, does that thing. And Seegers and Nock Chang both found that it increased ATP by five times. So it's just the flow of electrons that your body doesn't have to work for. Mm. Your mitochondria make ATP by this, it's a peptide, uh, kind of an enzyme system where electrons flow down this. It's like a big pachinko machine, you know? If you've ever seen one of those, those tricks that they show on, you know, 
on YouTube where you have a ball that drops and that lands on a little diving board and that goes down here and that makes that happen. Okay, That's how you make ATP. There's a, a structure inside the mitochondria that just tra moves electrons down a big pachinko machine and you end up with ATP at the end of it. And so ju just the current, unmodulated, non-frequency specific current will increase ATP production by 500%. And there are practitioners that want to develop new frequencies for, let's say, things like the mitochondria. Well, one of the things that I've been pretty hard-headed about, because I want this to persist, I do not want, it's too important, I do not want frequency-specific microcurrent relegated to the woo-woo weirdo group. It's like, no, sorry, this is real stuff. This is physics. Mm -hmm. It's not magic. It's physics. So when we have a frequency for, let's say, a tissue, there is a, f a frequency for the tendon. And there is a frequency for torn and broken in the tendon. And if you combine those two, you can repair a tendinopathy in 60 minutes. Okay. It's, it's easy. You can, you can feel the tendon um, and, and you can document that that frequency really is working on the tendon. When you treat the nerve, you can do a sensory exam. And now this nerve is hypersensitive and painful. And in 30 or 60 minutes, this nerve is normal sensation, not painful. You can, you can measure it. You can see it. The people that wanted to, and I've had people that muscle test for frequencies, and it's like, okay, if you are, if that frequency works, how will you know? So they want to develop a frequency for the mitochondria. Great. How would you know that it worked? Well, I'd have more energy. It's like, not necessarily. You can't tell. The current by itself will increase ATP production, right. but you can't document it. There are so many causes for fatigue. So the assumption that fatigue is a mitochondrial dysfunction is completely invalid. It just doesn't hold up at all. Cardiovascular disease, heart disease causes fatigue. Sleep apnea causes fatigue. Infection from root canals or Lyme disease or viral infections or an infected gallbladder or a pathogen in your gut cause inflammation and that causes fatigue. There's six or eight really well-documented, clear-cut causes of fatigue have nothing to do with the mitochondria. Every now and then, like there's like 0.1 or maybe one or 2% that actually have a documented mitochondria genetic mitochondria defect and they don't live, mm -hmm. right? So why would I want to treat the mitochondria? At, you know, maybe 50 years from now when we're done documenting everything else that we know how to treat. But right now I want something I can see, something I can measure, something that will change patients' symptoms and pain. Mm -hmm. So fully 50%. So this course is now four days. Our advanced is two full days. Every other year we have a symposium. So we have those coming up in Phoenix in uh, uh, March. And so the course is four full days. Can lay people attend the course just, just to be able to help themselves and their family? Or, or does someone have to be a practitioner to attend your courses? I, I've had lay people attend. Um, even some like massage therapists, the, the level of information is aimed at medical providers. So MDs, osteopaths, chiropractors, naturopaths um, all have a, an intense four-year training that includes a lot of background. So I know where I was going with that. Fully 50% of the information in the course in this four days is diagnosis. How do you, right? So I have low back pain. Okay. 
there's you can have low back pain from facet joint problem, inflammation in the facet joints, inflammation and injury in the disc, trigger points in the muscles, um, a uterine fibroid, ovarian cyst, lymphoma, prostate cancer. What's causing your low back pain? Inflammation in your colon, that can cause low back pain. Where's it coming from? How do you tell what to treat? So over the last 22 years, it has become obvious that we have to treat what is causing the pain. So yes, you can feel the muscles in your neck are tight and the muscles are sore. So I could treat the muscles and it took 12 visits in eight weeks. But if I now treat the ligament injury between the occiput C1 and C2, and I treat the adhesions in the dura between C1 and C2, and inflammation in the facet joints, injured ligaments in the spine, inflammation in the disc, I haven't done anything for the muscle. I haven't used a single frequency for the fascia or the muscle, and all of the muscle tightness, muscle pain, and trigger points disappear because the frequencies are changing what's driving the muscle to be tight and to have trigger points in it. Mm -hmm. So we've taken 12 visits and turned it into three by treating the cause. It's absolutely fascinating. It is. It is fascinating. <laughs> I, I really, really, really hope that many of the practitioners are listening become your students because I, I want to see this become a household become something that people go oh i i was in a car accident i gotta i gotta go get my my frequency specific microcurrent session you know i, I want it to be known because this is like it's it is just crazy that this has been around for a hundred years or more and and still in the dark you know, it's just, it's just crazy. Well, I know the listeners are listening to this show because they want answers and they, they are looking beyond the standard drugs and surgery or wait till you get sick response from their doctor. They want to find what works. This wraps up part one of this amazing interview. Be sure to tune in to the next episode for the continuation and completion of our interview with Dr. Carolyn McMakin. I know that you enjoyed today's interview. Please definitely come to the website, learntruehealth.com to check out all the show notes of today's interview with all the links to everything that Dr. Carolyn does, as well as the show notes and links to all the wonderful episodes. And definitely check out that new feature on learntruehealth.com at the very top in the menu bar where you can see Ashley's recommended holistic health gadgets and goodies to help you have an even healthier home and kitchen. Excellent. I'm glad you enjoyed today's show. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Are you looking to optimize your health? Are you looking to get the best supplements at the lowest price? For high quality supplements and to talk to someone about what supplements are best for you, go to takeyoursupplements.com and one of our fantastic true health coaches will help you pick out the right supplements for you that are the highest quality and the best price. That's takeyoursupplements.com. Takeyoursupplements.com. That's takeyoursupplements.com. Be sure to ask about free shipping and our awesome referral program.